we have about 13 million monthly gamers on across the service, and we have lots of developer partners, um, over 500. We recently partnered with three of the largest mobile carriers in North America, Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, and our uh, AT&T relationship really kicks off in high gear starting next month when we, we actually are preloaded on all AT&T devices, both tablets and uh, phones. Um, kind of our claim to fame is really uh, not only the, the way that we distribute our game service, but also the fact that we monetize 100% of our gaming audience. And we do that through game rental on the PC side, um, advertising, and purchases. And advertising is a, is a big uh, part of what we do, and it's, it's something I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in, in a minute, but it's certainly um, a great way to make money, and uh, we've uh, been able to figure out ways to, to uh, bring the highest, some of the highest advertising CPMs in the business to our platform. Okay, so on to some things that are happening um, in the Android world, certainly, or in the mobile world. Um, we focused on Android as a, as a platform that we wanted to develop for about three years ago. And this, uh, this next slide I'm going to show you is what we thought might happen. And uh, occasionally, you're right in this business. And it turned out that in Q1 of two th 2013, Android shipped 162 million devices uh, as compared to iOS is 37 million, and Windows Phone 7 million. So Android is, is definitely um, here to stay, and it's a fantastic platform. It's wide open, and in many ways, it reminds me of the PC business of 10 years ago. Um, lots of people are developing uh, uh, devices for the platform, and there are a lot of different business models, a lot of different partners to go to. Uh, that's a great thing. It's also a challenging thing. Um, someone earlier in the last session asked about how um, you know, they can break through the crowd and, and, and break through the, uh, the fact that there's so many different games uh, out in the market. Well, one of the ways is just to do things a little bit smarter than the next person uh, bringing the game to market, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Partnerships, um, and uh, I'll, I'll get more into that in a minute. So one other thing I was going to mention here also is that there are over 900 million active Android devices right now in the market, and those devices have not been optimized yet in terms of making money on gaming. That's something that I think we'll see over the next year or two is uh, Android kind of blowing past iOS in terms of, of the money for gamers. So um, just a little uh, quick uh, slide here on, on operating system changes that we've seen. Um, What's interesting is uh, last year at this time, it was a very different landscape in terms of, of what developers, uh, what platforms they would have to support. If you look now, um, our service uh, is actually a little bit ahead of Google Play in terms of, of adoption, um, but uh, Android 4 is, is really um, taking over, Android 4 and plus. Uh, 2.3 is, is becoming fewer and fewer uh, are, uh, out in the market, and if you are looking at what do you what should you support in terms of the device the the uh, the, um, uh, the devices that are coming out they change very very rapidly and one of the reasons is I, I know this is certainly true in North America um, people change their phones on average every two years so uh, phones don't stay out there in, in the marketplace that long so if you don't like uh, the operating system as it uh, was two years ago it's you don't have to wait too long for it to change. Uh, PCs are on average about seven to eight years people change them, five to, to, to seven years, and uh, TVs are even longer. So if you're looking for a platform that changes fast and evolves fast, this is definitely one of those. What we've seen in terms of uh, predominant phone size on our, uh, on our service is probably not what you've heard of in the uh, media. Um, a lot of attention goes to the very large and the very small devices, but the fact is that most people don't have those devices here. And if you focus your QA predominantly in these arenas or in this size, you'll, you'll do very well. So don't get caught up in the very, very large and the very, very small device size. It's mostly hype and it's not what most people are buying. So here's where uh, I'm going to do a little soul letting here. We, we ran our, uh, we've been running our Android service for about two and a half years. And we've made some mistakes, and there's been definitely been some challenges for, for doing it. I think the first 
mistake that we made was we made it uh, mandatory that our currency uh, be used. So um, David mentioned that we, you know, were one of the first uh, companies to bring a digital currency to to, uh, to market. We actually own a patent on that um, technology, and we were very proud of that, and, and it's worked very, very well for us in the PC side. Um, we made it a um, mandatory um, uh, adoption for our, our Android players to purchase coins and then spend them on uh, free-to-play games. Um, that turned out not to be necessary. Uh, we, we don't need that interim step for players to uh, change into our currency and then change again into whatever the game currency is. We thought that free-to-play games three years ago when we designed the service would um, need a currency to purchase items. We didn't anticipate that every game would have its own individual currency. So we are changing that right now. Um, within the next month or so, we'll have this uh, um, will no longer be the case on our service. Players will not be forced into our wild coins um, before they purchase things in free-to-play um, games. We also focused initially on premium games. Um, that was the market that we'd come to love on the PC service, and um, it was, a, quite frankly, it was easier to get to market faster by just focusing on premium games. And while they certainly play a, um, a large role in our service today, and they will in the future, um, it's not the only way to make money out there. Everybody in here has been, I'm sure, hearing all about free-to-play games, and many of you are probably uh, making them or have made them. So we now have um, great support for free-to-play games, and we're seeing a lot more revenue come through that um, that uh, uh, game uh, um, aspect. One other um, problem that we face having um, a game service that is not distributed through Google Play is unknown sources. Uh, we uh, Google designed their their uh, their operating system so that if um, you don't uh, adopt through their their um, game channel, then it makes it very difficult for players to get games that they want or get um, apps that they want. They have to go through page after page of, do you really want this? Are you sure you want to put this uh, um, app on your system? Um, basically, Microsoft did the same thing with, with Windows 7. Um, we found a ways around that, and we found ways around unknown sources on Android, but it took a little bit of time. And um, that's an ongoing kind of a, uh, a turf battle, if you will. We also uh, overestimated gamers' willingness to wait for game downloads. So we um, put a lot of uh, uh, large size games on our, on our service, and players will not wait for very long before they give up and move on to the next game. Um, we have uh, figured up ways around uh, queuing games and around uh, notifying players when they're going to have to wait a while to get a game. But that was certainly a mistake on our part. We, we thought they would, they would wait, and they simply won't. They're ready to play games when they're ready to play them. We also underestimated the audience appetite for games. We launched with under 100 games in the service, and players chewed through those games very, very quickly. Um, and they're only playing more and more games today than they've, uh, they were yesterday, and it's only going to continue. In fact, one of our, our partners was very pleased when we announced that we were um, publishing seven games a week on our Android service because um, they were seeing that many of their users were doubling, tripling, quadrupling the usage and the number of games that they were willing to play. The other mistake I, I think that uh, many people have made, not just ourselves, is to think of phones and tablets as the same uh, uh, platform. And, but it couldn't be more different. We think of phones and tablets as two very different platforms. Um, tablets are really, in our mind, they're computers without keyboards. They're, they're laptops without keyboards. And um, if you design your game for that platform, you've got a user who's willing to spend more money. They're usually gaming in a different location than they are on their, um, their phones. So it's a completely different environment and a different way that you can make money. If you um, uh, model your game after a, a PC, uh, uh, game, you'd probably be better off on a tablet than if you modeled your game off of a, a mobile game. And now, of course, it has to be touch-friendly, but the, the mechanics of it are probably much more PC-like, and you can certainly get more money out of a game, uh, out of a player on a, on a tablet um, than on a, on a phone. Um, I'm not saying that our, our whole reason in life is to get money out of gamers, but we are in this to make money, right? Um, languages. Let me just talk 
briefly about languages and language support. So it's interesting. Google has absolutely no idea what languages game apps have in, uh, on, their, on their, their storefront. Um, they don't track it. They have no clue on what is going on in terms of, of uh, languages and localization. So that means that this is 100% the developer's responsibility. Um, and it's up to the developer to decide what languages to support. And Google's not tracking it. We, we are on our service. We, we want to track the languages that, that a game has so that we know how to market uh, appropriately to different uh, regions. Um, but this is really on, on developers to figure out what, what languages are important, which ones they want to support. We have our own ideas on our service, what languages make, make uh, sense. The Western market, obviously English is, is number one. Um, French, German, Spanish are, are up there. Um, second tier for us would be Dutch, Italian, Portuguese. Now, this, this can be argued uh, whether Italian is, is going to be important next year, but um, Russian and um, uh, might take, take over for that, but those, those markets are a little bit more difficult to get into. But certainly for us, uh, if you're not localized in English, then you know, you're missing out on a massive, massive opportunity. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I'll, I'll just um, tell you a little bit about the way that we look at English. There are 1.5 billion English speakers worldwide. It's a lot of people. And in North America, there are over 350 million gamers, or th people. Um, it's a very connected and diverse audience. And North Americans spend more money on gaming than almost anyone else. I think Japan is now equal to the, the, the money that North Americans spend on gaming. Um, there's a lot of support in terms of, of, of business model. Um, there's, uh, especially on Android, there are many different partners to go to, many different ways to get gamers, um, which is um, not exactly the same on iOS. Uh, lots of partnerships that you can uh, enjoy as a, as a game publisher and developer. So free-to-play. Um, free-to-play games on Android are very interesting, um, but you have to ask yourself, you know, why you, do you want to make a free-to-play game? I think the obvious answer for that is to make money. People think free-to-play games uh, are like money trees. That can be the case, but there's, it's not good enough reason to do it because everyone's doing it. And the reason I say that is free-to-play games are very different from each other. And when I say free to play, you might think something different than someone else might think when, when they say free to play. There's a freemium model, there's free to play model, there's a lot of different ways to um, set up your game to, to monetize with free to play. And there's a lot of things you have to think about when you, when you um, support, uh, uh, when, you, when you make a free to play game. One is, are you ready to support it? Um, and I'm not warning people away from free to play games. We love them, they're gonna be great in the future but you have to be prepared. It's not just make a game and, oh, I'm just going to, uh, at the very last moment, make it a free-to-play game and, and change things. You have to ask yourself a lot of questions before you put it in the market. Are you going to charge for items? How much are they going to be? Are you ready to change that weekly, daily, if need be? Um, what currencies are you going to have? Are you going to have dual currencies? Um, are you going to uh, manage your economy? And who's going to manage that economy? Um, are you ready for uh, worldwide server support to manage a free-to-play game? Um, there's ongoing development that needs to be considered. So the reason I'm um, kind of bringing up the, the negatives of free-to-play is that it's not the only way to go to market. There are other ways to take a product to market. And if you're not ready to answer all these questions, then premium might be the right, the right way to go. Smaller teams, premium is a great way to go. One of the ways to make money on premium games is advertising. And the way that we look at advertising is um, it's free money. It's more money brought to the table by, yes, a, a suit, if you will, but they're, they're giving money to, uh, to us in this system for a reason. One is they want their brand associated positively with something that people enjoy, gaming. If you associate your brand in a negative way, meaning uh, it's, uh, you tell the user, well, you, you're going to get these ads. Unless you pay me money, I'm going to stick ads in front of you and you're going to hate it. I'm going to put terrible ads. They're going to be banners. They're going to pop up everywhere. And if you give me money, then I'll take them away. That isn't a very good association. And if you're running um, a brand campaign, if you're an advertiser, you're not going to pay a lot of money to get that kind of inventory. But if you associate brands in a positive way, 
meaning giving the users something when they watch an ad, not, not necessarily um, uh, putting it up as a, as, a, as a roadblock before they get what they want, but more as an invitation to watch this ad, get something that you want. Then you can uh, enjoy much higher CPMs. On our uh, game service, we get up to $125 and, and higher because our direct sales team uh, sells inventory that the uh, user then chooses. They select that in they select to watch the ad, and then they get something of value back. It might be the game session, it might be a, uh, an item in a game, but that's a much m po more positive way to associate um, your brand with with a um, an end user, and the rewards are there in terms of dollars. Zero to two dollar CPM is a hobby. That's not a business. That's, that, that is a terrible, terrible way to make money. $125, that's a business. That, that, gets, that gets you interested in, in, in how much money you can actually make. Premium games, as I've mentioned, advertising uh, can grant access. That's the way we do it on our service. You watch an ad, get, get a session. On a free-to-play game, advertising can be utilized for what we call value exchange on our, on our service and also uh, our technology that we've licensed out to other companies like EA. Um, they, uh, an end user watches the ad uh, in, a, in a positive way, gets, uh, gets an item back, and what does that do for, for you? It primes the pump. They, they now know how to buy an item. And tomorrow when they come back to, the, to that game again, maybe there isn't an advertisement available for, that, uh, for them to watch, and they, they want that item. They want that power up, they want that boost, and they'll finally pull out their credit card. So we've absolutely um, dialed this in on our PC service and are doing the same thing right now on our Android service and that's teaching users how to spend money and using advertising dollars to do that. So if s there's a game session being played on our network today, we're making money on it, either through advertising, rental, or purchase. And it's found money. It's, it's, it's absolutely a great, fantastic way to bring in on our service over 50% of our revenue comes from advertising. So uh, here's some real-world numbers. Um, if you look on the, the left-hand side of this table, that's the CPM. If you can, if you can get your uh, CPM up into the $50, $100, $25 range, um, that very quickly your premium game, if you look on the far right, the revenue that you can make can outstrip what the value of a premium game is. So we can actually make more money on our game service by having players not purchase a premium game and using advertising than we can if they just buy it outright. So advertising, when done the right way, the, I guess the, the takeaway that I want you to, to think about is when, when it's done the right way, it's a great way to bring money to the table. So um, I'm going to just very briefly talk about what's going on in the PC um, world for, for us and for, for others. Um, this last year was, it was somewhat challenging for, for PCs with Microsoft's release of Win 8. And, um, just before I go on, I want to, want a quick show of hands of how many of you in here are developing for, for Window Win, Win 8 right now? There's one. Okay, that's one more than I, I thought. Oh, does he? We should talk afterwards. So, um, the interesting thing for us, we have more players today on our PC service than we've ever had before. So, a lot of talk about the demise of Windows, it's, it's not true. I mean, Windows is, is absolutely here to stay. If you're betting against Microsoft, you're making a bad bet. Um, Microsoft has, has um, uh, enjoyed uh, success over the years, and there's a reason that they do it. It's because um, they, when, they, when they make a mistake, they admit it, and they go out and they correct it. And I, we really feel like um, this year, um, good things can, can definitely happen for the PC service. And the fact is, there are still a lot of, uh, of PCs out there, and there's more shipped every year. Um, Microsoft, I, I, I believe, has admitted a lot of their missteps with Win 8, and I think Windows Blue is going to correct a lot of them. Hopefully, we'll get the Start uh, button back, Start menu. I think that'll help a lot. Um, there are still over 100 million plus computers shipped every year in, across the world. That's a lot of, of of people out there that are still buying PCs. And the fact is, PC uh, players spend more money. That's just, you know, you could argue all day about it, but it's an a absolute fact. You know, a whale on um, a PC game can be $100,000. And they're out there. People have spent 
$100,000 on a free-to-play game on a PC. On a mobile phone, probably not going to happen. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not great games on mobile phones that are going to make a lot of money on players, absolutely. But when people sit down at a PC, they're much more willing to spend money than, than someone who is on a phone. Today, competition on PC platforms is lighter than it's ever been. I've, I can't remember a time when there have been fewer games released on PC. That means that the shelf life of games is much longer than it used to be. You make a great PC game, and it's going to stick around and make money for you for a very long time. And the fact is, PC distribution is relatively easy today. Um, there's a, uh, quite a few very well-developed uh, partners out there that you can connect with and uh, get your game to market very, very quickly. So I'm saying make PC games if it makes sense for you. Um, we certainly um, believe in it. We make a, a great deal of our money off of PC, and, and we don't think it's going to be going away anytime soon. Two quick slides here on some advice that uh, I can give you if you're a developer in the room uh, making games. The first one is uh, the axiom that I really believe in is keep it simple. Um, game players are not going to read. So we see games um, on our service a lot where a tutorial is written and whoever wrote the tutorial really wants to get it out there because a player wants to get in and play a game and suddenly they're reading page after page after page about how to play their game. That is absolute death knell. If, if a player has to read in order to get into your game, you are not going to make money on that game. It's just not going to work. Uh, so don't write a tutorial. Make the game play your tutorial. Keep menu screens limited. In fact, if you can make your game without a menu screen, it's even better. But one is, is plenty. We've seen games that have more than three, four menu screens. It makes no sense. Do, uh, do a better job of architecture in your game, and you'll, you'll, your game players will be happier, and you'll, they'll spend more money. Another thing about uh, UI should be unnoticeable. Um, basically, if, if you sit down a player and you watch them and they can't figure out how to use the game, then you need to work on that a little bit more. I really believe in iteration and testing with, with game players. Um, game mechanics should be intuitive, touch mechanics. If you have to train people, again, it, it doesn't work. So um, none of this stuff is earth shattering, but it's, it's absolutely violated over and over and over. We see um, 20 games a week on our service and uh, ha over half of them violate these rules over and over and over again. Uh, find what's of value in your game and charge for it. So back to what I was saying about free-to-play games, if, if users um, value the, the, the power-ups, great, charge for them. If, if users value changing the sword uh, for their player, charge for that. So whatever the value is of the game, that's where you can put the payment wall, uh, if you will, uh, in between that and the user. And then this one is from the heart. I, I really believe that you should make a game that you want to make that you want to play, and then the audience will respond to it. I get questions all the time. What kind of game should I make? What, should I make a hidden object game? Should I make a, a match three game? It doesn't matter. Make the game you want to make, and the audience will respond. Um, match three games are fantastic. We do very, very well with them. People said they were dead two years ago. It's not true. Players, um, what's the, um, one of the best playing games right now on iOS? It's a match three. So you just can't say that. And lastly, Winning approach to taking games to market. So uh, first is you make a great game. That's easy. You guys can all do that. Then you select your, your, uh, your way to, to, to market. And then the last thing what I really want to highlight is you need to support your game. And very often running a game service, I can tell you, developers do not support their games. They don't have a dedicated account manager. They don't have a great communication plan, meaning if you're doing any price changes or any updates to the game or any um, uh, new builds, you've got to have a great way to, to get that information out into the channel as fast as possible to everybody at the same time. Uh, be prepared to prep your, your APKs, um, meaning uh, strip out things that a developer or that a, a, a partner doesn't want in there. Um, don't link off to competitors. Uh, if you build it to link off to, to your own site or your own games, be prepared to, to change that to link back to the, to the partner site. We very often have to go round and round with developers and with partners to change their APK so that we can release them in our service. And then deliver to all your partners at the same time. Just put it together and, and go.
go out all at the same time, meaning have a, have a plan to get it to market. And then lastly, um, I think Torsten mentioned this, spend some time on the marketing copy, spend some time on the assets that you deliver because that is the, 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 the way that users are going to learn about your game is through the, these assets. And quite often, very little time is spent on that and it could be the most important step that you, you take as a, as a game developer and a publisher. And I believe the last, very last thing is be easy to work with. You know, it, it, is, a, it is a partnership. Um, when you deliver your game, when you pick a partner uh, to, to work with, if you do not uh, make that relationship easy and, and you don't spend time building um, a, a partnership, you, you simply will not get the, the extra love that can take your product to the next level with, with that partner. And I think I ran out of time. I think that's it. Thank you, Dave. Yeah. We have time for one question. Anybody have questions for Dave from Wild Tangent? All right, I have one. Nobody else wants to jump in. Um, when you, you were talking about making PC games, you're talking about thick client games, downloadable games. What kind of PC game do you mean? So um, PC games, uh, we do f very, very well with downloadables. We also have a fantastic um, success rate with online, you know, uh, free-to-play MMOs. So um, s recent partners that we've signed, uh, actually we've been very, very um, shocked at how much money it, um, can be generated off of an online free-to-play game. But downloadables are, are very, very viable, and, and uh, you know, there's, there's been a, a lot of talk about the death of, of PC gaming, and it, we just haven't seen it. Um, we, um, we're doing better today than we've ever done in PC. Awesome. Thanks very much. Thanks.